All right. Um, <clears throat> well, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, let's see here. Um, I'm going to give you a, a, a quick safety minute here. Um, and I know we've talked about this before, but um, I'm in the process of uh, redoing my dust collection system in my shop. And I have, a, I have an Oneida three horsepower system, but um, I, I'm finding that uh, as I'm spending more, a lot of time in my shop now that um, I've just developed some sensitivity and, um, and, you know, you start reading about dust and, and what it takes. And in my shop, which is about 450 square feet, if you look at the OSHA requirements for allowable um, fine dust in, in that air, um, if you were to put an air meter on there, but it's, it's, it's about the, the total dust in the suspended dust in the air is about a half a thimble full. It's about a quarter of a teaspoon. That, if you have more than that in, your, in the air, suspended in the air in your shop, then um, you've exceeded OSHA requirements. Essentially, if you brush off your clothes before you leave your shop, you'd probably put more particulates in, your, in the air. So it's just an awareness thing. And, and, and what's scary about dust is it's cumulative and mm -hmm. this fine dust, the submicron dust, um, it, it, never, it never leaves your lungs. And so it just gets worse and worse to either develop emphysema or COPD or... Um, so um, uh, it's, it's on my mind right now just because, uh, again, as, as because of the COVID stuff that, you know, I'm, I'm in my shop 30 hours a week or more and um so just uh just take the right steps um if you don't have a hepa dust collection system in your shop then you should probably wear a respirator but um those are your individual choices that you have to make but just 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 be aware so um or, or excuse me steve i need to add a tiny bit of me because i was out in the shop the other day and I ran into one I'd never run into before. Um, I use an acronym SAFER, speed, aim, fasten, eyewear, rotate. And I'm pretty meticulous about it. I was doing a piece and things started to shake a little bit. And eventually I found that one of the screws in one of the jaws to my chuck had managed to wiggle itself loose. And 10 years of using that chuck, that's the first time it's happened. But moving forward, as I go through my safety check before I start anything else, I check those screws now. Good to do. All right, good. All right. Okay, with that, uh, I think we'll go ahead and start the gallery. So uh, as Norm brings up your pieces, um, you can uh, just talk about it. Uh, we'll give you feedback, or but you know, um, anybody has any questions, just go ahead uh, and uh, we'll go ahead and start. Okay, um, I decided to start, uh, these are some of my first attempts at making platters. Um, you win, stop. <laughs> <laughs> well, th this one is, this one was just such a spectacular piece of wood that I decided not to put any kind of decoration at all on it. It's just uh, slightly dished flat on the top and, and slightly curved on the bottom with a, with a very subtle sort of recess so it has a foot to sit on. Um, it was just a spectacularly figured piece of sepele. And... Wow. I've never seen sepele like that. I didn't either. That's really a magnificent piece. Is it... Um... Um, did it tear is it, out is, in the up and down grain? No, it did not. Very sharp tool. Um, I kept my tools really sharp, but no, it really didn't tear out. Um, we found just, it was luck, probably 2008 or thereabouts, I found that piece. It was at a lumber dealer near Cleveland, Ohio, which I don't think exists anymore. Um, Cleveland's still there. 
Yeah, Cleveland is, but I don't think the lumber store is anymore. Um, and they had this piece, which was, you know, essentially a platter blank. And then I actually have a piece that looks just like that, that's 15 inches wide and eight feet long, um, that I'm going to use as the headboard for a bed. And uh, the, the guy at the dealer said that when they cut it, they'd made a mistake. They were supposed to actually make it into veneer and they sawed it into boards instead. Wow. Okay. So, so it's uh, finished with? Uh, walnut oil. It's beautiful. And what's the, the diameter? Uh, it's about 11 inches. And you and should, that, you the, should uh, see the info on the top right of your screen. So the um, the the lighter parts in that is that was it punky at all or is that just the way it? it uh, I mean, was no, it soft? It's, no, it's not soft. It's completely solid, and um, it's just that's the way it looks. It's just that figured. Wow, that is a, that is a spectacular piece of wood. I, and, and, I and, a very, and a very nice turning too. Yeah, I agree with your choice. You really didn't want to uh, try and that. Moving on. Never, never have seen the intersecting grain like that. That's beautiful. Um, I've been making things for the house out of maple, and I end up with a lot of narrow strips ripped off, ripped off the edges of boards. And so I decided to glue it up and make a platter. And then I added a couple of strips of cherry that were left over from another project. Um, this one is obviously not quite so spectacularly figured. So the walnut, the, the, the contrasting woods, walnut? Cherry. Oh, cherry. cherry, okay. How do you engrave? A wood burner. Any questions on that one? What's the finish? Uh, it's walnut oil also. It's an interesting way to use scraps. Yeah. So is that is that um, just regular? I mean, is it is it like Mike Mahoney's walnut oil, or is it? Uh... It's Mike Mahoney's walnut oil. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So so it does set then. Okay, uh, cherry accent really. Uh, it does harden eventually. It takes a long time. The cherry accent really uh, makes the glue up fit really well. I think it it uh, makes it so the glue up actually looks natural. Right. Very nice. Well done. Gene, are you here? I don't see Gene online. You want to skip over and come back if you come back, Steve, or what? Yeah, yeah, yeah let's do that. Remind me because I'll forget. Bob's here. Ah, oh, yes, this is me. As you know, well, I've, your forehead anyway. I've done a lot of these uh, natural edge cross grain pieces. And if you step back to the first photo, yeah, the inside finished up very nicely. Uh, there's a couple of coats of walnut oil and then a couple of coats of, uh, oh, hell. Anyway, one of the oily finishes. But when I got to the back, which is the next picture, I discover I got some really punky stuff there in the center. And as you can see, it's very absorbative. And my question is, anybody got any ideas or suggestions on where I go from here? Well, if you were to use a polymerized tumble oil like Cell or Watco or something, it'll get into that punky wood and, you know, just saturate it 
the first time, let it set for a couple of days. You can probably, it'll, it, it acts as a pretty good sealer to, on that point. It might take a couple of tries to do that, but um, it, I, I, I've taken several pieces even to the point where I put it back on the lathe and turned it after doing that or sanded it because, you know, with the punky stuff is a lot softer when you try to sand it sometimes. So, um, but um, that, that's what I, that's how I've approached that. If I've had a piece like that. Didn't CA glue works good to it. Yeah, um, it's a lot of CA. I'd be more tempted to do the oily material, something a little heavier than the walnut oil, rather than the um, CA glue. Light tends to stick well to like. I kind of like Steve's approach. So the, is it while the metal doesn't really hard well? I agree. Uh, the the finish on the other side is water logged. You put water locks over the top of walnut oil. Yes. Be interesting to see what it looks like in 10 years. <laughs> Well, I hope I won't own it then. Let's make it. <laughs> One of the things that we try to avoid is putting really hard over soft. That tends to mud crack with time. Um, walnut oil, if it's soaked in good, it's not going to cause any trouble. But if you've got any build and you put a straight poly over it, I would expect it to crack in a couple of years. The water locks has got enough, it's an oil poly blend. It's probably got enough oil in it to where you're okay. But careful how you put something really soft down first, then something really hard over the top of it. I thought just the center was punky, the center white. You, you, mean, the, you mean the inside finish different than the outside? At this point, the outside only has walnut oil on it. I haven't, I haven't, my issue was what to do with that punky center point. At this point, I, put a little water locks on it, let it harden up and go from there. So the only, the only punky part is right, that, that light part right there in the middle of the base? Yeah. All right, then actually, then CA might work there. I, I thought it was, I thought it was some of that darker stuff around it, but um, yeah, then. Yeah, if it's just a little area like that, then sometimes, I mean, CA should work. Yeah, and you uh, pull, won't go anywhere. Bob, lower your screen. We can't see you. Your head looks like the top yeah. of this book. That's all we see, Bob. <laughs> well, that's there great. you go. Bad hey. Martin, that looks like you. All right, moving on. All right, this is actually four walnut boards laminated. This thing's about a foot tall. Uh, and my question is, what would you do with the bottom at this point? It's, it's pretty rough. What, you mean the teeth marks? <laughs> yeah. Maybe make a bead. And and the, and the, I suppose the next question. My instinct is to put a a cone in the open end, and just some pushy thing on the tailstock to be able to hold it and turn it. That's what I was thinking. A jam chuck, just a homemade cone jam chuck, and the uh, the uh, tailpiece on there. I think. How wide is the uh inside rim oh like three and a half probably three and a half yeah i think the, i think the cone on the one-way live center would probably work as a gm chuck <laughs> might, might not get oh might, might just blow that you might just separate it put too much pressure on it well there's that worry it's it's, so, it's, it's well, been, right, it's been glued up for a while. It's pretty strong, and those walls aren't super thin. Um, there's nothing on it but walnut oil. 
I had a similar problem with, remember the flasks that um, I made once? So how do you hold that? Because it would be a very small neck. I actually just made a very long cylinder, just slightly uh, convexed the outside and basically pinned it from the inside. I got gotcha. you. So the pressure was actually on the bottom. Exactly. Good idea. Mm -hmm. uh, guys, I've never done this myself, but uh, maybe like make four or five feet on the bottom of that. This is the bottom treatment you're asking. Yes. Cut it into a bunch of feet. Good idea, Alan. Mm -hmm. I may have seen it. I never tried it. But a lot of footed bases are really great. You know that well, kind. Bob, of yeah, Bob's done that with bowls already several times, yeah. right? Oh yeah, yeah I've, I've I've done a number of footed bowls. I hadn't thought about that here, but that's an idea. That's a good idea. Yeah. You're welcome. Three feet is always three feet are always nice because uh, they can't tip <laughs> or rock. Uh, that's that's what I always do. Is three, four is tricky. Well, you uh, could always always, tricky. unless you just drop it onto a belt sander momentarily. Hey Bob, you could always go with a deep discount and leave it alone. <laughs> 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 All right. I like the curves on that piece. Yeah, I think the form is pretty. All, All right. right, moving on. Bill, are you back? Yeah, I'm here. So I continue to work on my birdhouses, trying to come up with some different techniques. And here is one where I have drawn on the top and on the body of the birdhouse itself and then colored it in. And I'm using this, maybe you can see it there in the picture. That's what I'm using for the color. And this is what I'm using to draw the, um, let's see, can you see that? Micron pen. Yep. Yeah. One of the problems that I'm having that maybe you guys can help me with, Jeff, I know you're kind of an expert at some of these finishes, <laughs> is that I get a little bleed on the black. And I've got it here. Maybe Norm said the resolution wasn't too good on what I sent in. I don't know that you can see that any better, but I, I'm getting a little bleed. It's not too problematic there, but it is right here. Now, what I'm doing is I'm sealing it with this first and then I'm doing the artwork and then I am finishing it with this so that is a two-step process actually I'm using a, a, a semi-gloss and then I'm using a gloss to to put it on there any ideas of how to keep that from bleeding well I, I can't see it well enough your the bleed is going it's with just the a couple of places Wait, right the, what's bleeding the black ink into the wood or yes the top coat? Well, i don't know I'm, i assumed it was in the wood but i've got a coat under it i started out sealing it and then i do the artwork and then i seal it with the spar urethane so you seal it with a sanding sealer first nope i don't i use you i just do that. this uv archival matte finish I, it, I do that right after I turn it, then I draw it, draw it. Could you determine at what point the bleeding takes place in that yeah. process? It was after I did it with this, but it only did it in a couple of places. It didn't do it across the entire spectrum of the item. That's what frustrated me. If it had done it everywhere, I, and, and I tested this with a couple of, you know, blank pieces of wood before I did it. I am I happy happy with that spray uh, Minwax spar urethane. Uh, yeah. It just doesn't spray as evenly as, as uh, like deft. Uh, lacquer. I mean, what what you see looks good on the clear. I don't know if that causes the the bleed, but are you happy with that spray 
varnish. Yeah, it's turned out really nice. It gives it a really nice uh, shine, sheen. So I've been real pleased with the, the, the and, and I've done a number of them, and this is the first one that I, I ran into, and it was only on the black, so it's kind of okay. weird. Am I moving on? Yep. Um, Bill, Bill, shoot me an email tomorrow. We can talk about it, all right? Okay, I'll do that. All right, Jim, you there? Wow. Yeah, I'm, I'm here. <laughs> um. This is a, a piece that came out of my backyard, was a, a piece of Austrian black pine that uh, the worms got into it, uh, which is what left all the, the holes and the uh, sides of it. So kind of like the Norfolk Island pine, the branches tend to come out all in one spot. So while this is, is basically an end grain bowl, the dark circles are where the branches were coming out. And this particular piece, um, the gray staining is, is almost all just on one side. Uh, so it's kind of a, a yin yang bowl. A um, couple of the things that, that well, I'm fighting with the finish a little bit. It was the seal uh, uh, cell, clear seal cell, and it it soaked up so much of it, particularly on the end grain. It actually added weight, appreciable weight, to the bowl. Um, but a couple of questions. I've uh, been trying to get away from my my squat bowls and, and just curious about uh, the perception of the form of this thing as, as one question and the other is that there seemed to be enough going on with the figure in the grain that I decided not to try and fill the holes with some kind of, of coloring uh, like the acrylics or whatever and would just like some feedback on those things. You wouldn't see the 15th color. <laughs> now you made a brilliant decision to not add anything else to it. Yeah, I'd agree. And, and yeah, as beautiful as it is, yeah, it's distracting. You about the sealer cell adding weight. You don't necessarily have to load on sealer cell in that first coat until it absolutely won't hold another drop. Get it really good and wet with the seal cell, wipe off the excess, give it a day, put another thin coat on, and you'll come out in the same place as if you soaked it all the way through with a quart of the stuff. Okay. Yeah, you, you talk about wiping off the excess on the, the bottom of that thing. There never was any excess to wipe off. It soaked in that fast. You don't got to keep pouring it on and pouring it on and pouring it on and pouring it on until it quits soaking in. Okay. Get it good and wet two, three light times, quit, light coat the next day, and you're there. Okay. Back to the form, I think the, uh, the worms did a really nice job uh, with the limb grains coming out. I, I would applaud the worms. You have some talented worms. Yeah, the, uh, I, I almost would have, have sent in a, a shot of the very bottom of the bowl because the worm ate the pith right out of the tree. And, and trying to center this thing up well, it was a little bit of a beast because there was a wormhole right there. <laughs> So are you saying that you're hiding the fact in these photos that it's the funnel? Correct. <laughs> it, it, it is a funnel, but it was created by nature, not me. Sure, sure. <laughs> Where did you get a piece of Australian black pine? I'm sorry? Where did you get the piece of Australian black pine? Out of my backyard. Uh, <laughs> 
it was a tree that we planted probably 20, 25 years ago. And it had grown up to about 15, 20 feet. And then the worms got to it. I actually had, I planted it, I cut it down. And can I ask Jeffrey, since we talked about sealer cell, I have the problem that I have a gallon of seal, or what is it, a half gallon or a quart? And I don't use that much of it. And after two, three months or so, it dries up. So I have to waste whatever's left behind. How do you prevent that the sealer cell hardens so quickly? Um, your best bet's just to toss it and buy more. And you that's can, what I'm doing, and it's not inexpensive. All right, stop. You, can, you can buy a can of that Bloxygen stuff. It's nitrogen gas and purge the can every time. Um, you can also go to the paintball stores. You can fill a canister there with nitrogen gas, rig up some parts you can buy there and make your own nitrogen purge system. But basically you're gonna fill that can with an inert gas or half of it's gonna go bad, you're gonna throw it away. This, uh, this is a company, mail order place. I forget which one, but they have these plastic bags for storing stop. finishes stop in. Stop loss bags. Hmm? Look up stop loss bags. Okay. Um, Stefan, think of an IV bag for your, for your uh, finish. Yeah. They give you a special valve and you get a funnel, you pour it in, and basically as you pour it out, you're, ex you're uh, shrinking the container so there's no excess oxygen in it. Yeah, that's cool. I, never, those I, know wrong. I consider those things a gross safety hazard and would never use one. But that's just that? my, my opinion. Why is that? Because polyethylene, polypropylene, and all the rest of the poly, this, that, and the others, sooner or later swell in the presence of mineral spirits that's in that paint thinner. Um, in the lab, we used to store mineral spirits in Nalgene plastic bottles. And about two months in, you can't get the lid off anymore, it's swollen up so bad. Um, you know, flammables and combustibles in a plastic bag is not the best idea in the world. 15 bucks for a can of finish and you use half of it, I can live with that. I had sealer cell in a stop loss bag for about a year with no issues. I mean, it's not jam packed. It shrinks and expands a bit. You don't squeeze every bit of air out of it. You just get most of the air out. So it's not like a half bowl can. Stop loss bag has three kinds of plastic. I don't know what they are right now, but um, it's not just like it's a single layer bag. All right. They thought it was true. Uh, let's, uh, and check it out. All right, there's a there's another option, guys. It's uh, maybe we Hello? lost you. What was that? It might have been Terry, but he's muted. I oh, I, sorry. Um, yeah, it was Terry. Um, if you throw glass marbles in your thing, you can uh, basically fill up the jar with glass marbles and exclude the oxygen. They're not too <laughs> expensive and they're pretty inert. That's true, it's an old trick. I, hear, I had one other comment about the funnel aspect of that, of the previous one that was on the screen. Uh, that might be a good time to put some uh, epoxy you know, resin or something and make that into a foot or some embellishment on the bottom, you know, contrasting color, you know, something to, to fill it, make it not a funnel, but still, you know, add something to it. Oh, okay, I, I understand what you're saying. Just an idea, another idea. Back to me. What? Uh, back. A while back, I brought in a uh, spaceship shaped nightlight. This is the latest for grandkid number four, um, maple and bloodwood. Um, done is an open segmented piece, uh, except for the center ring there. That's compound cut uh, to get those diamonds as a segmented ring. A um, couple of double A's in the, or triple A's in the bottom 
and two LEDs uh, so the kids can, so you can cut it on when you go in the bedroom and see what's going on. The drawing, the drawing was actually a ball, but as I started turning it, um, the uh, egg shape looked real good and I quit. Really nice. Excellent choice. Beautiful. You're going over to the other side, Jeff, going to segmented and things? Yeah. <laughs> um, I, do, I do a little of both. Therapy may be in order. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, no. oh, no. Right here, this the <laughs> very nice, very nice too. The uh, the layers of blood wood, um, and maple there, the finial really came out really nice. Well, thank you. That was uh, um, maple down the middle, then blood wood, then maple. And if you turn it right, you can you get the kind of pattern you see there. Cool, it's nice. Reed. Yes, sir. Would you join us? Be more than glad to. Um, beautiful piece of pecan. A uh, friend of mine gave me the piece and I went out and it, it's just a normal looking bowl. But um, if you notice that little ring going around it, Someone who saw that said, why did you make two bowls? And it's not two bowls. I went and bought online one of those um, ring devices, you know. Ring. That's already cut the size about a half inch. Yep. And that's Beat what that is. And so I didn't burn it, but yet having that little piece digging back inside, made it look like two bowls. So I found it interesting. So that's just a shadow. Yeah, beautiful. Black. Say what? That's just a shadow, it's not a black line? Uh, just, a, just a shadow, yes. Or it may burn a little bit whenever the little feet comes around and you kind of work them back and forth. It might have dug in enough to make a little shadow, maybe a little burn but I didn't burn it. Did you turn it wet? Um, turned it wet, let it sit. Well, actually, I probably had the log for a good year. I turned it wet, let it sit, and then came back and turned it. So I probably let it dry after the first turning uh, a good six months. The con's a whole different animal when it's dry, isn't it? Oh, it is. And it's just beautiful. I enjoy working with it. Uh, as you can see in the back, all that black. Um, sometimes it adds to character. Sometimes it just falls out. It's like turning iron, though, when it's dry. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. But, but the idea, the finish, I, I like to work with um, white on polyurethane. Maybe some sand and sealer on the first coat, just to let it um, let the grain pop out, sand it down a little bit, and then I do sand and sealer, and that probably has about five coats on it. Okay. Nice. The ring gives it a very nice illusion. I agree. Thank you. All right, Jim Duxbury, you want to unmute and join us? I sure do. Um, my grandson graduated from high school and uh, he played baseball in high school. So I made him a wooden baseball and uh, bloodwood and oak and walnut, I guess, stand. Just fun. He's got, I, I taught both of my grandsons to be wood turner, and turners and my son too. And uh, they're both pretty good wood turners. In fact, uh, it's been really great that at, at 10 years old, probably nine years old uh, and, and 11 years old, they both uh, had stuff in galleries and they were making about probably a hundred dollars every two weeks. So for a nine and a 11 year old, it was really good. But now, now they can kind of appreciate turning balls. Very nice. 
to turn that with a jig or just freehand? Freehand. Um, I turn a lot of balls. Uh, I don't know if you've been to the club. I, I showed, I have four balls on a stand that I can, that right. I turn and they rotate. Um, <clears throat> in fact, I, since we've been off with this virus thing, I've been studying physics and I can now uh, do the math to turn the ball almost mathematically and I can turn tangent points on the ball. Mm -hmm. You get four balls exactly the same size. You get uh, four tangent, at least three tangent points, and then you can just fill in the gaps in between. But it, it takes the guesswork out of making a ball. How did you draw the line for the stitches? Not the stitch itself, but the, 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 the spiral. I, I'd like to say I know how to do that, but uh, to be <laughs> honest, it takes many tries. And I have no idea the proportion or... Uh, or what it takes to do that. Um, I, I kind of sketch it out and erase and move and there's got to be some way of doing that. It's a like a quarter, quarter, quarter or something. And I don't know. Well. I'd like to say I know how to do that, but I really don't. I would have ended up taking a real baseball, cutting it out, and then yeah, I get a pattern from it. <laughs> <laughs> now there's a good idea. <laughs> Why do I think of that? <laughs> well, it'll have to be the exact same I'll size as the baseball. The wheel. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty Usually, cool. Usually uh, covers a pattern. It's a really nice choice of wood. The contrast and all with the blood wood and the wall in it, then the maple. That's a very nice time. Thank you. Thank you. Gorgeous. Uh, I just hope he doesn't use the ball. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Once. One other thing, the, uh, the base really brings your attention up to the ball too. Very, very nicely designed. Thank you much. Yeah. Um, don't hesitate to be critical of my work because I really appreciate that. <clears throat> that was as critical as I could be. Sorry. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I really appreciate anything that somebody says. This is, uh, did you ever have a task you have to do like every three days or, or something where it's pretty hard to remember? Did I do it? Did I do it two days ago or four days ago? Or I, Anyway, I have this little disc. It happens to be divided into seven. And I have a peg I put in. And every morning I index this another whatever. If I have to do something on every three days, I, I know when the third day is coming. That's all it is. It looked more like more than that, but that's all it is. <laughs> Wow, Jim, you got too much time in your hands. <laughs> I've been told that. Uh, this is the first PDA. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Jim, the problem I would have with that is I would need another one of those to remind me that I had done that. <laughs> Good well, point. This, this is the Where first the thing you do in the morning before you put your underwear on, okay? <laughs> Move that pad. I would still need it. Sorry. Are they <laughs> calling too much information rule? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you don't use so underwear? Oh, okay. <laughs> Where do you put the batteries? Yeah, no batteries <laughs> in this one. You could sure use it by a calendar as a calendar by putting Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday on there. And well, then, then there's you seven what digits. day of the week it was. Well, that's true. There's seven digits, but if you have to do something every three days, it doesn't correlate with uh, Monday, right. Tuesday. Uh, the day change. So uh, I just did, and this has worked great. Uh, I don't even know what I've made it for, but it's <laughs> been really great. Um, All right. Joe. I'm up. So these are pepper mills and they use uh, the crush drying mechanism, which is, which is next to it. And uh, that mechanism uh, is, is a little different than some of the, the conventional pepper mill mechanisms uh, in that it adjusts from the bottom. You can see that neural knob on the bottom. And the, uh, the top piece, which isn't shown for the mechanism, uh, basically is just the heel spring that pressure fits to, to hold uh, the top in place. 
So the the trick with this making making these um, obviously there's the the contrasting woods, um, just the a lamination and the dimensions are chosen to get the kind of shape that you want when you turn it. But um, with with this mechanism, I don't I guess I don't know if you can really see it in the photo or not, but there there's several prongs there that hold it in place. And the tool next to it is made by Sorby. There's also one made by another company. Uh, so basically when, when the stock is rectangular in shape, you need to grab it in spigot mode with a chuck. And after you've drilled partway through the bottom, you have to use that tool to cut a ring on the inside. So when you eventually put the mechanism in place, those prongs will expand and lock it and lock it in. So that's that's a little tricky um, because you, you have something that's 12 inches long or however long you want to make the pepper mill uh, that's only supported at, at one end and you're trying to cut cut that groove with that tool. So Joe, I, uh, I this Steve, I, I've made dozens of these crush grind pepper mills and I just sand those tabs off and epoxy that thing in there and i've never had one yeah, fail, so. i mean that, that's what a lot of people do that's that's yeah. the easy way yeah <laughs> but now you defeat those tool sales yeah. <laughs> uh, i think yeah. i mean uh, you know most of you could probably make make that tool if, if you wanted to i mean it's not yeah. if you have machining skills you could you could probably make one <laughs> The uh, the other thing I, I've noticed with those tabs, if it, it's not so much with pepper, but when you start using them for salt, that sometimes it it still spins in there a little bit. So again, to, that's why I started gluing mine in. But I love the shape. I love the laminations and the shape. I, I mean, that that very nicely done. The way those laminations highlight the contrast there. That's a. Uh, that's what I did good. with the, the one on the right, uh, which is Chuck. Chuck the Viga and Ash, I used uh, some of the sanding dust uh, from the Chuck the Viga to kind of highlight the grain pattern. Well, that's nice. It looks you a lot like done. the, uh, was it humanism or something like that, emblem? You could probably sell them to them. Yeah. <laughs> no, right. that's, uh, that's very nice. What are you finishing them with? So the, the one on the left, actually isn't isn't finished yet um the one on the right was uh minwax polyurethane flat polyurethane even though it never looks flat um since then i've i've switched to um general finishes makes a flat out flat they call it it's a, it goes on as a very thin polyurethane so it doesn't have that plasticky look and then i use the the veal system uh, to right. polish, but I, I skipped the white diamond with these with these marker woods. Right. So you, you just run into too many problems with that. And I then, uh, just jumped out at me that uh, I wonder how it would work if you do a pepper and a salt mill to reverse the colors on the salt mill. I just uh, that just jumped out at me as a possibility. I wonder how that would look with the dark highlights and the uh, light wood for the salt. I like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually did um, a salt and pepper mill and did the pepper in walnut and the salt in maple. And it looks real nice sitting beside one another and you can tell what's what. It works. Yeah. I can ask you, what did you mean you run into too many problems with the white? Um, with the, the, the white, so the Beale system uses um, three compounds uh, and, and the, the polishing wheels are designed to, to match the compounds. They have slightly different materials in each one. So the first one is um, Tripoli and the second one is the uh, white, white diamond. And the third is just the carnauba wax. And the, the white diamond is just so very fine that when you have darker woods that have any kind of gray pattern, 
it kind of gets in there and it's impossible to remove it. So you see these little white streaks in the wood. So that's, that's why I, with, with dark woods, I, I usually skip that step. If you're working with uh, lighter wood, like maple or ash or something like that, then it works perfectly. The videos we shared in the newsletter uh, is Steve, Steve's uh, own take on finishing and he goes into exactly that on yep. buffing. Great, thank you. I've, uh, I've managed to get some of that white crap out with uh, mineral spirits on a rag, but you're right, it's, it's a challenge. Okay, let's move along. We have uh, Alistair joining us early. <clears throat> so so uh, this is um, because I'm the holder of the Alistair video or DVD. <laughs> That's right. Um, <laughs> I've been able to watch it like 10 times and I figured, well, I'll, I'll try uh, one of his techniques. Uh, so this is just a, a round cherry platter, <coughs> eight and a quarter inches uh, in diameter. There's front and the back. Um, but what the, there's nothing super special about this, uh, but it's finished with black milk paint. And the lye in the milk paint then reacts with the tannins in the cherry and when you burnish it after the milk paint has dried, it, it uh, gives you these red highlights. Um, and it's kind of cool. Yeah. Um, what do you burnish with? Well, you burn normally, uh, you know, his recommendation is burnish with a green Scotch Bright pad. Um, but here's a lesson that I learned when making this is don't put the milk paint on too thick. Uh, yeah. You're better better to put on a thin coat uh, first, or two thin coats. And I ended up putting mm -hmm. one big, one thick um, coat, and then I had a heck of a time burnishing it after that. And I just rubbed and rubbed and rubbed, and never did. Uh, well, I started to see some of the red highlights. Finally, I switched to the 3M radial uh, bristle discs, and uh, that brought the highlights out pretty quickly. <laughs> How did you create that pattern? Is that just for That's with uh, rotary chisel. Oh, you know, okay. uh, there, there are several different configurations of uh, rotary chisels. This is the uh, smaller one, and it has the three points on it. So it kind of oh, gives so it cuts three, three lines. Yeah, it cuts three lines. Oh. And then, I, I, you know, I made the uh, radial lines while it was uh, on the lathe, and I could use the indexing system. And then okay. uh, kind of, and, and then you just cross, you, you know, Chris, Chris uh, make all your cuts and crisscross it exactly yeah pretty, pretty cool that's that, that's nice john um is the back the looks looks cool, the uh, copperish to me it's, mm -hmm. it's really pretty it's yeah. Red. Oh, yep yeah all right so oh, john, by the way you know thing, i john one thing no, the, the the uh overdue fine on that that uh video uh, $10,000 now. Yeah. They have to sell that. You didn't read the fine print, but uh, <laughs> they have to sell that platter for a thousand bucks to pay for it. I'm, I'm more than uh, happy to send that uh, DVD either back to Bob or to whoever needs it next. Cause, yep. uh, no one needs it. We're just, just, just pulling you right. in your chain. Yeah. And, then, and then when Al Sturt left the room, Ben Foe showed up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this one. I, so my neighbor lost a big uh, Bradford pear tree in a storm a few months ago, and I got the wood, and I made a ton of things out of the um, out of the pear. But as you all know, pear is a pretty boring wood. I mean, it's just a light wood has very almost no grain pattern at all. So I decided, well, I'm going to practice some other techniques with it. And so the, the techniques I wanted to practice were thin walled turning. I got this down to three thirty seconds of an inch and, uh, and then piercing and uh, pyrography and then texturing and then painting afterwards. So I've been playing with it for probably a couple of weeks. <laughs> you left out Lichtenberg. No Lichtenberg, right, right. Oh, I'll tell you one other thing I did with this, which was kind of fun. Um, I, most of you know I used to be a photographer, so I thought, I wonder if I could take some of my images and use them, you know, and in my woodwork. And so I had this image, uh, a mountain image from Rocky Mountain National Park, and then the bird image of a seagull. And I just researched in Photoshop how to convert an image to a sketch. 
And once I had it converted to a sketch, I printed it on a laser printer uh, backwards and then laid that down on the wood and took a xylene pen and rubbed mm -hmm. it over the, the uh, paper and it transfers the image to the wood. Um, and then obviously I painted over that, but. Right. Uh, if, you, uh, if, the, if the technique of that interests you, you might want to check out vinyl cutters. Makes life a lot easier. Oh, where you uh, you print onto thin vinyl, yeah, 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 yeah. And no, I'm cut, aware of that. Cut it out, and then you can basically trace it. So you, yeah. Oh, that's cool too. No, I that's used tough. some frisket on this. I tried some airbrushing mm -hmm. on it. I did. <laughs> I've used every technique I I've been trying to learn on this one piece. That's cool. So when, when you photograph that, did did you uh, photograph? Did you light the ends from the top? Did you shine a light down? from the top to uh, highlight the, the inside? Um, the, my light, I use a soft box to light it. It was right. pretty high, yes. It was um, probably three feet above, um, above the thing. And uh, so Look yes, it was a fair, fairly yeah. high. It wasn't directly down into the right. base, but it was, uh, no. it was fairly high. You can see that from the shadows. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's, uh, that's that's nice the way it, it it brings back it brings the background in. That's that that adds a lot to the photograph. Mm -hmm. Um. I don't think Ted has joined us. I texted him, but he he's uh, no show. So I'll keep it alongside. Not much to say about that if he's not here. I think yeah. it had cracks, so that's why he did the copper inlay. Um, oh, my piece is next. So I've been playing with cityscapes, uh, skylines for a while. And again, this one, I, I got the image on the computer because I was uh, trying to manipulate it and actually change the, um, oh, I'm going to mess it up. You know, make it a curve so it's not just straight lines. Um, and I had a lot of fun. This is only 10 inches. I will be trying it again because it came out way better than I expected. This is the first time experiment. The resin was so so. Um, but there it is in the back. It is. It's not clear at all. It's translucent. Again, uh, I use this Art and Glow resin because I have a little bit left. I won't be using it again. It's a little too gummy at times. But um, the I have a third photo in here because you got to see how nasty this was to make. So I started with a full size blank. And I used a parting tool to just cut away the back. I, I know the photograph, the first photograph isn't super clear, but you understand what I'm talking about? I basically mm -hmm. removed a ring, set it aside, put my template on, and uh, I, I wanted to do this after sitting in uh, Maria Lay at NC State Craft Center teaches band saw, excuse me, scroll saw work, but I can't get to NC State and I don't have a scroll saw. So I actually did that cutout on my Rikon bandsaw with a, <laughs> I'm not kidding, like a wow. made, uh, four TPI uh, three quarter blade, just a big honking wow. blade, back and forth, back and forth. And you can tell by that third photo, it was nasty cut. Yeah. But how I long did it take you to cut it out? Uh, I, you know, maybe an hour, maybe, That's maybe not, not too bad. Yeah, half an hour or so at the bandsaw, you know. And then two days to sand it. Yeah. <laughs> it, sanding took a little while. But again, I wasn't too worried about it. The main thing I was happy about is I recognized that it was light wood and I wanted a shadow kind of effect. So I took the time after sanding to paint that outer edge with uh, black gesso mm -hmm. so that it would cast a shadow from the, the resin behind. And that, I think that worked out really well. Uh, so then I'm gluing it back onto that ring. And my biggest problem is so, and the, the last shot there is uh, the dam I made out of just the, it's that uh, yard sign material. I just cut it up so it, it will curve and wrap around. I basically create a glue dam and I pour the resin in. Um, and I had a nasty resin leak in making this. And, but the leak was from the wood glue joint. No. <laughs> yeah. So I had resin coming out of one quadrant of it up onto my table and I realized it was that I had a, a somehow a blank spot in the wood glue joint. I have no idea how, but it was just enough that it kind of messed it up. 
So my pour actually was in two stages because one quadrant of it lost half its resin. I had to mix more color. But yeah, I'm kind of happy. It, uh, if you can see it, it is translucent. So Norm, if you want, next time you have to make that dam, buy, just go to Amazon. They, they make these uh, HD, really thin HDPE cutting boards. Um, they're just a couple millimeters thick. And I just cut those into two inch wide strips and um, it's a lot easier than trying to bend that corrugated stuff. Oh, uh, well, actually it's not hard. That corrugated stuff, I, all I do is uh, I figure out how steep the curve is and I just take a knife and cut and cut a relief every third, fourth, fifth cell. So it, it'll wrap nicely. How does that uh, HTP stuff bend? Uh, it bends fine it, and it, I just hot milk glued onto my to the to the rim and uh, and there's no it just it, it adheres directly right to it. It, it it works really well and it comes off very easily from the uh, from the resin cool so I can say not you know I learned some lessons about my resin pour uh, the design I shouldn't have taken the design all the way out to the edge I should have taken it further than the wood edge I don't like the fact that some of those steeples actually hit the outer edge it bothers me a little bit but uh, the concept worked way better than I thought. Very nice. Yeah, that's that's very nice. Cool. A, nice, a really nice shadow in the resin, too. The black edge worked well. You looked like you did a nice sanding job. I have to tell you, I bought a sanding belt for my uh, bandsaw. I bought a three quarter inch by 111 inch sanding belt from Klingspore. And put it on there and it sends the daylights out of stuff it would go straight into that and do a real job you have to make a, a wooden flatten for the back of it but i'll tell you it, it just sends the daylights out of things wow interesting the other thing i realized afterwards is i probably would have been better off if i put uh tape or something on the back end i would might have had a little less tear out on the on the bandsaw but you know Live and learn. Very clever. Thank you. Steven. All right, so this is uh, another one of my router series. Um, so this is, uh, it's just uh, say about 13 inches, about uh, four inches. So this uh, has a solid rim. So I, I turned, I left this thick, uh, routed the grooves from the backside and then uh, turn the inside and left, uh, just left that, uh, that thicker rim just off the top on the inside to uh, support the veins on it. And uh, it's just, just fun. Uh, just to, again, it just, and what's interesting, cause you're using a round router bit, you kind of get that uh, tapered, the grooves are, you can see the, the taper on each end of the grooves, just the way it comes, you know, when you, when you cut it. Uh, on the inside so um it uh yeah just just fun it's finished with uh with seal cell and uh I ran out of resin uh, yeah <laughs> beautiful no, this, beautiful uh, design no that uh that the, the rat uh, just just playing with that router jig is just just so much fun i just that the, 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 the possibilities are endless is that 24 grooves uh i don't remember looks Maybe like it yeah that. i mean the uh the robust comes with 48 so it's some it's yeah, it might be 24. so uh, it is 24. Yeah. next one yep so i did um uh, and Norm mentioned it. I, I have a video up on YouTube right now about finishing, and um, I did uh, two walnut uh, pieces. That, uh, and this is this is their their side by side. This is Clara walnut. Uh, what I've determined is just so difficult to to photograph walnut, <laughs> but the 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 figure on this is just phenomenal. But um, what Joe was talking about, you know, with the um, with the Beal system. Um, you know, particularly like walnut has, you know, this fine open grain. If you look at where the, the glare is there, you can actually see that there's a, a little bit of a, 
uh, you know, it's just the, the, it's an open grain wood. And um, if you were to ever to touch this with the Beale system, you'd have <laughs> you'd never get the white out. So um, what I do is I use a I put it after I put the seal cell on there uh, just to just to denib it. I I just put it back on the vacuum chuck. Uh, you don't even have to center it really, and I hit it with a white Scotch Brite pad. Um, and then I and then I just put the wax. I just buff it with the Beal system. And I use, I use the Carnuba wax, and then I have a um, just a wheel that has no, nothing on it. As a, as a, I add a fourth step to the Beal system, so um, but uh, so that that's it. And uh, it's just that, and, and it's hard to appreciate this from this picture. But every once in a while, you turn a piece that just works. And this the shape of this, and um, I, I don't know. It's just. It, it, without without actually seeing it in in real life but it's just the curve on the inside and the outside just flowed perfectly and um it's it's really a i mean i i really like it I, it may be one i keep for myself just in the wall thickness is about quarter inch it's it's consistent right through it, it again it's just one of those pieces that just worked and uh you can see how this was finished uh, in the video on on youtube but um so, any questions on that one? What would you achieve if you used one of those sanding sealers or pore sealers? Would that make it more shiny? And then you would be able to use the white um, steel yeah. sanding part? So, I, I will tell you that what you see here is before I waxed it because I was worried that's just that finish that's on there is right off, the, is right from seal cell. I didn't do anything to it. But I was worried about getting too much glare um, when I um, if I put the wax on it. So, but but Stephanie, I I don't think you could seal this grain. I think if you did, if you touch this with the white um, beal, no matter what you did, you would get that. You would never get that grain. Um, and plus, what's interesting is that, that this Clara walnut actually it 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 almost has like a leather texture to it and and look. Um, and I don't think you'd want to. I don't think you'd want to seal it. I mean, I think part of the appeal of this is that with the satin finish on it, with the soft finish, is that um, I think it enhances that that open grain a little bit. But I think it would be very difficult to seal. It. And yeah. why is that anatomically so difficult to seal? For example, with multiple layers of sealer cell, I would think that would eventually close all the pores. No. Um, we're talk talking a couple different things here, gentlemen. Sealing and filling pores are two completely different things. And those products that will fill those pores, and I showed some of that when I did the talk on finishing, you fill those pores with that stuff, um, those materials are full of talc and clay, and it will give you a haze. And you're a whole lot better off looking at those pores with a little seal cell not completely filling them than hazing them with filler and steve did exactly the right thing there quit don't try to fill those pores it will it will cause it will give you a haze that you will not be happy with and anatomically pores are just larger than the the other typical um things that you fill with a seal cell Absolutely. Yeah, this is yeah the walnut. It, these are it, this is a it, this isn't like ash with that broad open grain. It's um yeah if you you can kind of see it there. It's it's go up to nor if you can go over to where it's where the glare is. It's probably the best best view of the texture of that. Um, but it um, on the other on the inside there's some. Oh, you can see it right there. Quit, Norm. Yeah. 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 So. Um, yeah, it, it almost it, it it it's just that's just due to the curly nature of the wood, and so for me personally, I don't I don't go to a I I don't typically have glossy finishes. I I like the satin, um, the softer finish on it. First of all, if it, the piece is going to get handled, you don't get fingerprints and other things on it. But but it also it's a it's more forgiving. You would never get a glossy finish on this piece because you'll never get all those pores filled. And I have one thing that will fill all these holes. 
you know, a product that I use uh, on a lot of my goblets is um, System 3 Clear Coat. Uh, it's a, it's a, a runny, it's a runny epoxy, but it will fill these holes. In fact, uh, if you're not careful in, in any undercuts you have on goblets, it'll just fill those in. So you have to be careful and brush them out. But uh, it hardens very hard. If you want a satin finish on it, you come back with uh, uh, like one of those white, uh, what do you call oh, it? Scotch uh, bright. Uh, Scotch bright. Non woven claws or, yeah, non woven abrasives. And that will just give it just this nice little, you know, satin finish on it. But it'll fill every damn one of those holes and it's, it's very clear. Yeah. And why would you fill it? Because eventually you have more of a glossy uh, finish? No, if you want to knock the edge off, no, you want to fill the holes so that your surface is entirely smooth. But you don't want it glossy, so what you do is come back with a, a non-woven uh, abrasive. Um, you can get uh, green, the red, the gray, and the white, and the white being, I think, the finest. And that will give you this beautiful little um, semi-gloss finish and then you can come back with your renaissance wax and put on there and have the finish that steve's talking about but what but is it, the it, purpose of closing the pores what difference does it make to the look it's all a matter okay, of what you, know, you want that part to yeah. look like if you want it dead smooth you fill the pores yeah those you can do pores, it with epoxy though those pores are on a millimeter scale and a paint film is on a micron scale. You've got a factor of a hundred difference. What Richard's talking about is a hundred solids liquid, no paint thinner, no nothing. You can fill them with that or you can fill them with something full of talc. What the Richard's talking about will look nice and shiny if you want to and can be knocked down to a satin finish. But I, in fact, I've done it a lot. Um, absolutely. It, it's, uh, it's a good filler. It's uh, basically chemically inert because it, if you mix it correctly, um, everything um, you know, is converted to just a solid epoxy. You can use all kinds of uh, fluids on it and it's not going to deteriorate. Uh, if it does a little bit, just come back with your um, your polishing cloth and polish it up. Can we, uh, can, sorry guys, can we move on? We're after the hour, we got four more pieces left to get through. Terry, you wanna tell us about this one? Sure, um, go to the other picture first, if you would, Norm. Sure. So this was, this was a really odd piece of black maple um, burl, and I didn't really know what to do with it. So I threw it on the lathe. I didn't know how to put it on there, so. I put it on between centers and I ended up making a box out of it. Now the problem is, uh, you know, uh, I use the cone center on the, on the bark side. And so in the other picture, you can see where I made a divot in the bark with the cone center. Um, there's really not a good way to grip um, the, the top except for the tenon. Um, so, I have to figure out how to basically um, hollow out the underside of the lid a little bit since it's really thick and heavy. Um, and I also need to figure out how to disguise the hole. My first thought was to try to cut a piece of bark and I saved bark from the other piece to kind of fill it. But I'm also thinking now that I will probably just uh, use the tenon that's on there to uh, to drill a hole and put a, uh, a little finial um, in the lid to disguise where the cone center was. Appreciate Terry, it. I, people yeah. have. Terry, this is Steve. I would take that. I mean, the, the, the texture under that bark is uh, with burl is just, I mean, it, if, if that yeah. bark will come off, um, and I use a pressure washer to take bark off, but you could probably pick at that. And, and take it off, but I, I think you'll be- the, I like it the way it is, it's great. Yeah. 
Yeah, the bark's on there really hard, Steve. I had trouble getting it off. Um, so okay. I really want to start it and then screw it up. Frankly. Yeah, okay. All right. But Have you okay. considered doing Good something talk. like uh, carving a little apple finial, you know, like the like on a cherry or an apple, you just have a little stem and you just kind of carve it out by hand where it's narrow on the bottom and a little bigger on the top and mm -hmm. just glue okay. it in there. Yeah, I was thinking about a standard finial, but that's a good idea too. I mean, since it's natural on the top, it would look like uh, maybe a twig coming out. Okay. So there's all kinds of ideas you can do on it. It'll look yeah. great. Just a and small knob finial. So it wouldn't take. Well, you don't want it too formal now, since it's natural on the top. You want to keep right. that. Theme. What I was looking at is the um, all the different shapes. The over on the right, middle right. If you made the knob kind of so it, it looks like that, even uh, you know you could. Of course, then you get to uh, the point of. Or are you trying to make it look like that? So I like the stem idea. I think that's a good one. I'd actually get a natural edge bowl. I'd take, so it's three inches wide. I'd start with just an inch. I'd hollow out that inch down to bare wood, just to the dead center. Make it like a miniature bowl, take some of the bulk out. And then if you, you know, if it looks kind of weird, take it all the way out to two thirds. Just leave one inch of bark around the outside. So, so it's kind of like a bowl on top of a box. Yeah. Okay, that's a that's a different thought. What about attacking it from the back side? But the only you know, it's there's no real good way that I can think of to chuck it to try to hollow out on the back side other than do it by hand. Well, if you do, as I say, and you just go like a parting tool, a nice solid inch. You could right. actually put a small pin jaw expansion chuck to hollow out the inside, then remount it on that tenon and do whatever you're going to do on the on the outside top. Or right. some kind of jam chuck, yeah. Is the right term Longworth chuck? Yeah, it's uh, not gonna it's not gonna hold in a Longworth chuck. Because no. if you look at if you look at the other, it's very, very irregular. Around the rim? The top is the no, top. No, no. He's not worried about right. that hole. Sorry? He, want, you, he wants to hollow out the inside of the lid as well. That's what we're talking about. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And the only thing he's got to hold on to is that bark side. That's not going to, uh, long worth, that'll go flying. Yeah, he's cut around the edge, so he could do a jam chuck. I yeah, might I, be able I, I, I might be able to. The jam chuck is the only sensible the, you know, it, it's it's curved. It's smaller at the base and gets wider all the way to the top. So um, it's it's still very uneven um, at that top edge. And if you like gripping it around to open it up, you might even carve you a little ladybug and use that <laughs> to cover the hole. That would look cool. Could you use a donut chuck? I apologize. Um, I'm going to have to drop do a donut. All right, Jeff. Maybe I don't have one of those, but I might. That's an idea I hadn't thought of. Yeah, it's going to be hard to that, that top surface is just going to be hard to hard to grip. Now let's move on from that. Um, okay. so this, is, this is also my piece. Um, it's an it's an end grain. I think it's red uh, eastern red cedar, but I actually picked up the wood. Um, yes. It was, it's eastern red cedar. Hurricane Matthew damage in Beaufort. So I just picked it up along the side of the road. Um, but I couldn't figure out anything else it would be uh, with those colors. Um, and so I did it in grain orientation. It's about six inches tall. And the biggest diameter is about eight inches. Um, and I finished it with Danish oil because I really like the way that really darkens up the... Uh, the heartwood on the cedar. Uh -huh. um, I love the color. I hate turning this stuff and sanding this stuff because it's so brittle and chippy and cracky and 
if you don't get the sanding perfect, it leaves marks and especially when you're doing heartwood and sapwood. Um, was it bad. wet when you burned it? No, it I, I it was pretty well dry. It had been sitting around since Matthew, so a couple years. I just turned this um, about a month ago. It's very prone to cracking if you turn it wet, yeah, on end grain. It's very prone to cracking if you turn it yeah. dry. <laughs> well, it, it, even even to the point where if you sit, if you get it too hot when you sand it, it'll crack. So, yeah. To, but uh, you, yeah, you, then. It, on the left margin there, um, going through the sapwood, you can see kind of a, a little bit of a dark line. That's a crack. Yeah. And then there's a crack across the base um, that you can't see. Um, but yeah, there were several cracks in there that, you know, got super glued together. Yeah, that's. What's nice about cedar though is when, when you do get it sanded, it. Uh, if you do get it sanded and finished, boy, you can get a really smooth surface on it. It uh, it takes some some time, but boy, you can you can really it, it almost shines when you do it. Yeah, and I I actually did a little uh, buffing on the Beal system with this stuff too, so it's incredibly smooth where where I got everything right. Good, Ronnie. Ronnie, you're muted. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Okay, uh, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> no, it's uh, my first natural edge turning that I've ever done. That stayed together, I guess that's what you mean. And uh, on this view, it had, I thought it looked good, the grain. And then the, the bottom part, I just showed it because of the engraving. And well, the whole, you know, a, a normal person probably would have turned all that hole away because it's solid on the inside. But I, uh, I left it because I wanted the, the taller vessel because I've got use for it. But I also wanted to ask Norm about the, the engraving how to get more even because if you see on it, it where it says Ronnie, it's kind of not very good and then the C Davenport's not bad and the brand repair is okay and the dates kind of screwy but I think that may be the font and yeah, also, we, go ahead, we, were, we were chatting uh, a little bit about and I think uh, Stefan was having a similar problem with certain woods seeming a little fuzzy there when you have these uh, certainly the hundred dollar black box laser that I have you have to basically focus that dot to an absolute pinpoint. You can't be iffy with that. So you play with it, and you might take 60 seconds going back and forth saying, oh, it's getting larger, come in small. You need to get a dead, dead, tiny dot. If it's bigger than the tiniest possible dot, you'll get a blurry output. So that's probably what's going on. Okay. And we also, so that, that's, he said that's a little concave too, which can be an issue, but you've got probably a good fat eighth of an inch to play with. It's not going to be a problem, but don't take your depth reading at the dead center lowest point. Take your depth reading about halfway up. So basically you average out the height distance and that should help with that. But I, I can't say enough. Get your best reading glasses on and make sure that that dot is an absolute pinpoint. Okay. Thank you, Norm. Yep. Any other questions on that one? Last piece. Okay, this one is whether I should even attempt to go ahead and try to salvage it or not. I mean, it's going to take, if I put resin in it, it's going to take a lot of, probably a lot of resin. I just wonder if it's worth it or not. And also, I don't have a pressure pot. So if uh, anybody has any suggestions on what resin would work best on a, without a pressure pot? Well, is it is it punky, Ronnie? No. Is, is, is the wood sound? Because if the wood's not sound to start with, um, you're going to be fighting it the whole time. If it's if it's punky, 
if I, I and I've done a lot of work with Wormy Pecan and Holly, and I, I think last month I showed a vase that I had done, um, but but you have to stabilize it in a vacuum chamber first if if the wood's at all punky, uh, because if not, the, the when you try to sand, if you fill it with resin and try to sand it, the difference in hardness between the resin and the punky wood will make it impossible to 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 try to get a finish on it. Yeah, well, it's not very punky at all. And it's it's real dry wood. It's several years old, and uh, the the other side of it is solid, is a solid piece. Right. I think, yeah. I think if um, if you have like really square, clean edge holes, then you can fill them with resin. But if the holes get smaller and smaller and smaller, you're not going to force resin into those tiny, tiny cavities without a vacuum. And uh, Steve, help me. What is the stuff? Well, you need it, you need a pressure pot really to, to get it in there. Um, and you could use so if you don't have a pressure pot. Like Norm said, if you have just big a bunch of big voids, you can you can use a, an epoxy resin like Liquid Diamond or something like that that doesn't need a pressure pot to uh, to 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 set without a lot of air bubbles. Um, Alumilite, you actually you absolutely have to have a pressure pot. So, um, but um, but the pressure pot tends to force the stuff into the voids better if you have it. So I, I tell you, Ron, I would. Given that piece, I mean, it's not like it's a spectacular piece from what I can right. see there. It's got a crack in it. Um, I, I think you'd, you'd, you'll drive yourself nuts trying to trying to salvage that piece. I think any kind of resin you pour into that, you're going to be really disappointed when you discover that there was these tiny little pocket holes that the resin just never got to. Yeah, I mean, okay. if you if you want to do resin, you, you just just find a bowl that was about that size, make yourself a mold essentially, and uh, leave yourself a little annulus around it and um, just just pour the resin in. And But um, that's gonna take a lot of resin to fill all those holes. It'd probably cost you $25 in resin too. <laughs> right. So um, I, I, I'd say that that, I mean, I'm worried about the, the just looking at that wood and the tear out on it. That, I, I I think that that's not a piece you can you can really salvage. Even I okay. would probably would. Even I probably would do that. In the vac in the uh, vacuum chamber, if you want to try it. Lars knows what to do with that piece, right, Lars? <laughs> You're muted. <clears throat> if Lars. I were going to do it, I would. Um, I would get my tool real sharp and spin it pretty fast and just take incredibly light cuts and see if you can get that tear out to go away. Don't really oh, even ride we're gonna don't, burn it. Don't, you could just burn it, but um, don't ride the bevel though. You know, you need to do a real light cut to get around that tear out with real sharp tools, just freshly sharpened. Okay. Would you do that, Lars? Would I try yeah. that? Yeah. Would you turn it? Or would you give up? Um, I would turn it some more. Um, Mike and Mike Bluot and I, we both just bought a forty forty jig, and um, I am so happy getting. I'm getting really sharp tools that cut really nicely, and so um, these days I've been just practicing taking ultralight cuts that um, don't need any don't need much sanding. Cool. Well, this is the last piece in the gallery. I'm just curious. Show of hands. Who would turn it as opposed to giving up? Oh, I'd try it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, on the, really, I'm on the tossing one. There's also that really fine edge turning tool called sandpaper, which might work. <laughs> Well, you, you crunch it up and stuff it in the holes? Uh, I wasn't thinking of that, but yeah, there were a lot of alternatives. If this, you know, if you have other wood to turn, <laughs> I guess that would be, but you know, I, this would give a good practice piece. I mean, if I had this, I would probably try to turn it, but I would, uh, 
I, I it would be I would consider it practice. I wouldn't I wouldn't be uh, devastated when it blew apart. I'm worried about the crack that I see in there. I, I turn that at high speed. I'm worried about this thing just coming apart. Coming apart, yeah. Yeah, the crack, the crack is. I would stand to the side and just turn it till it blows up. And if there's some point in there before it blows up that it looks good. It's a win. Otherwise, it's. I try. <laughs> if, when you if get all done, when you get all done and fill it real good, you get half done turning and you find half a worm. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's a voice of experience. Been there, done that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Big through answer. a pressure pot. <laughs> Pecan wood is very good for smoking meat. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Do it before so you, you fill it, though. <laughs> All right. Well, that's the last piece. So um, I appreciate uh, any any overall comments on how this went tonight. I said we've been, we've been trying to this month. We tried to, you know, really emphasize to try to get a little more participation. People, you know, if their pieces are having problems with or questions with, so we had a few of those tonight. Um, any any general thoughts, real quick before we wrap this up? I mean, I I think the the added discussions were really helpful. Yeah, I, I think the, these come as close to a real face to face meeting as you can get, and I think everybody's individual input is really good. I mean, it 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 feels good. It feels like we're all together here.